end in an hour, so that's it. Okay. Um, I'm not Roy Laver, Robin Abrams. They're both out of the country today and asked me to step in and introduce the uh, panel this morning on uh, building blocks to define vibrancy. This is really looking to the future. You can see it's dated October 16, 3015. <laughs> <laughs> so we've heard about Silicon Valley 3.0. I'm not sure how far out this goes. In fact, I do think that's a typo. Um, David Rock on the panel is a local commercial real estate professional with other, over 40 years experience uh, in real estate, food and beverage industries, former entrepreneur, broker, co-founder of Bachman Rock Commercial Real Estate. Uh, I specialize in retail, restaurant, and office tenant representation, landlord representation, lease consulting. His clients include regional and national retail chains such as Armadillo Willows and the Melting Pot. Uh, Ted Kokonak is a commercial real estate broker who specializes in helping clients with investment and real estate sales and acquisitions with over 34 years of experience and more than 300 transactions closed in excess of a billion in value. He's among the highest producing brokers with Marcus Millicamp. Uh, personal time, he's an active and general partner, managing part of a variety of partnerships involved in a wide range of real estate activities, apartments, retail, triple net, mixed use, office, industrial, self-storage. They're both very involved in community activities. I met Ted many years ago when he was on a uh, city council appointed committee looking at uh, use of, potential use of property in downtown Los Altos. Uh, David, for the past 21 years, has been on the board of directors of the Los Altos, Los Altos Hills Little League and he currently serves on Los Angeles Citywide Parking Ad Hoc Committee. So they both spend a lot of time on community affairs and it's not to satisfy any conditions of parole. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, yeah, that I know of. And so I'm gonna stand here and just navigate this machine for them and uh, let you guys get started. I uh, first wanted to say that I was uh, <clears throat> fortunate enough to be at the Stanford game, not to throw any uh, local bruins under the bus, but. There was so much scoring in the first half, but I turned to Jackie at halftime and I said, I can't keep sharing for these scores because I'm losing my voice. Of so <laughs> course, this morning, that's what, uh, that's my time. <laughs> Where's our slides? Um, moving away, going back to 2015, uh, what we're gonna do today is talk to try to uh, talk in depth as much as possible in an hour about the value of Los Altos city-owned parking plazas, uh, the potential land lease income for the city, uh, how retailers and restauranters that we try to attract to the downtown view Los Altos in terms of uh, comparing it to other places to locate their stores and their restaurants, um, talk in depth about what is the ideal downtown mix of retail and restaurant, uh, and when I say retail and restaurant, that would include service businesses, uh, offices, and residential. Uh, and residential, of course, would be multifamily. Um, how does Los Altos measure up? Is it will be a summation of how we are versus uh, barometers and metrics that uh, cities throughout the Bay Area um, and throughout, the, you know, nationally use as a way to measure up. Uh, possible future solutions, of course, will be where we end up. So, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ted Coconut. Good morning. Um, Okay, so as Kim mentioned, I was on a committee back in 2008 uh, at the top of the last cycle um, because real estate is very cyclical in the valley that we live in, we love the cycle. Um, and what we did in that committee is we spent a little time figuring out what the city owned and where they owned it. And so this, the, the downtown parking uh, district has 19 acres in it of which the city owns uh, 47% or uh, 386,000 square feet. So go to the next slide just for a second. Oh, there it is, right there. So the area's in yellow, and I apologize, I don't have the great graphics that uh, some of the other people do, but um, <laughs> this is just a map, and the yellow areas are the areas that are city-owned, and you can see basically they border Maine and they border state behind the existing uh, uh, structures that are there. And by the way, we have Kim Cranston's father, and we have Bart Nelson's father, and we have uh, Jim Dozier to thank for these parking districts because prior to 1958, I believe, they didn't exist. So go back one. 
So, <clears throat> okay, we have about 440,000 square feet of existing buildings in that area, and the average age of that building is uh, 61 years. Uh, we had 1,161 parking spaces back in 2008. We've uh, lost some of those parking spaces because the city has done some parking lot realignments up in front of uh, uh, the grill and over on First Street, so that number is somewhat lower. Um, but so that's just kind of a, a rough number at this point. Um, so here's a question: How do we how do we establish value? Um, yeah. <clears throat> For the people in here, can I see a show of hands? How many of you live in town and think that your house is a valuable asset? Is what? A valuable asset. <coughs> okay. You people over there don't think your house is a valuable asset? You don't live in town? <laughs> Good response. So, uh, so how many of you live in a house that was built 61 years ago that has never been renovated or substantially uh, reconstructed? Can I see a show of hands? Huh. That's, a problem. That's a problem. So the average structure downtown is a 61-year-old structure. It was laid out in 1907. That was the, the when the town was laid out, and most of these structures were built between 1945 and 1960. Building codes, seismic codes, electrical codes, plumbing codes were all very different in those days. And by the way, the demands of the tenants were very different in those days. They didn't have Amazon in those days. <laughs> um, so um, I think that all of you are right, by the way, that your houses are very, very valuable. And the question is, why are they so valuable? Do you think it's, they're valuable because of the structures that sit on the, the, the lots that you own? Or do you think it's the land under the structure? Can I show a hand, a, a show of hands for People think their house is valuable because of the structure, in other words, the building, or they think it's valuable because of the land it sits on. Land it sits on? I think we have a uh, majority. Okay, that is probably the right answer because land values drive value. Um, and so what I did was I took a look at other downtown areas and Los Altos, and I took a look at land sales that have occurred in the last couple of years. <clears throat> and the average value of a piece of development land in the downtown core is about $576. Um, there's a mixed use site that just sold at 349 First Street in Los Altos. Um, Gary Candy sold it to a developer. Uh, he paid $753 a square foot for it. The building was built in 1960. That building will be raised. Um, let's see, there's an office renovation happened at 166 Main. Uh, dentist bought the building. It's the old uh, uh, office building that some attorneys used to be in. And then she basically gutted the structure, put up red steel on the inside of the structure because, you know, those walls aren't going to be there after the next earthquake. Um, and basically, she rebuilt the entire thing. Um, so she paid about, let's see, is that true? She paid $943 for the dirt. No? Okay. Um, development site on First Street. Um, Passerelle just bought a uh, gas station, a former, not gas station, what is that, a, uh, a little tire changing building or mechanics building over there. Um, that thing was built in 1952. They paid $674 a foot for the dirt. Uh, there's a retail building that's sold on State Street, uh, $500 a foot for the dirt. Uh, Nick Dura bought that. He got steel. Um, the, the, those buildings were built in 51. Um, Okay, an office building sold over on Sherman Ave in Palo Alto. Just to assure you that we are not unique in having these land values. Um, Sherman Ave, office building sold, 712 bucks a square foot for the dirt. It's got a 26,000 square, uh, about a 26,000 foot building on it. That building will be torn down. There's a $44 million construction loan that sits on that property as of today. Um, it's an office building that sold over on Santa Cruz Ave. That is the Bank of America building. Um, that building is functionally obsolescent. It's an 18,000 foot building. sits on a on about a 25,000 foot lot, but they paid about $700 a foot for the dirt there. Um, an office building sold over on Main Street. It's going to be torn down. Actually, it's a kind of an office retail building. Um, and Main Street, Redwood City. How many people know Main Street and Redwood City here and have been there? Is that 
Is that comparable to here? Is that as nice as downtown Los Altos? Do I see any heads going back and forth? Like, no. You're right. It's not a very nice place. So that one sold for three hundred twenty-three dollars a foot. I just sold a piece of land in downtown Redwood City for two hundred sixty-four dollars a foot, and it was about the size of this building. It was completely unbuiltable. Um, so five hundred seventy-six dollars a square foot. One way of figuring out what things are worth is you look at local comparable sales, and they kind of define the market as far as what things are worth. Another way of looking at what things are worth is you look at what's been built in the area recently, what is that building worth, what did it cost to build it, and whatever is left at the end of the day is the land value. So, 401st Street, completed in, I think, 14, corner of 1st and Main, 110,000 cars a day roll by that building, and within one mile raise of that building, the average income is $244,000 a year per household. That, by the way, is a household income that is only surpassed by less than a handful of communities in the United States. Three. So I would, pardon me? Three. Pardon me. <laughs> so I would submit to you that that probably is a pretty darn good location. In fact, if you ever play Monopoly, you know, think Boardwalk Park Place. Um, so the building is worth today about $48 million. I don't think Jeff Morris would sell it for 50. I don't think he'd sell it for 55. I don't think he'd sell it for 60, but <clears throat> that's probably what it's worth today, approximately. Um, and I use metrics that are within the constraints of the market. Um, the improvement value of that building is 26 million 260. Let me explain how I got there. I went to the city and I found out what the shell costs, what the site improvements cost for the for the you know putting the underground parking in. And then I took a look at the value of all the permits for all of the tenant improvements um, because different tenants spend different amounts of money. Um, by the way, I'm not suggesting that the owner of that building paid for all the improvements to their tenants. They did not. Is that correct, yeah. Counselor? In the back there? Oh, me? Yeah, I, I think uh, Helsing Simons paid $207 a square foot for their TIs. I doubt that Jeff put up more than $50 a foot over the warm shell. Is that about accurate? 50, 60? Do I hear 70? <laughs> so in any case, I took everything. I took all the value of the tenant improvements and then I took the cost of leasing commissions because the cost of leasing commissions is not an, inconsider uh, an insignificant amount of money. It's about $700,000. And then I put in a developer profit of 20%, industry standards 15. So I loaded this up as big as the numbers I could get for the value of the improvements and profit to the developer. It generates a residual land value of somewhere in excess of $22 million. That makes the land worth $640 a foot. This building was leased, the office portion was leased 15 months ago, those leases were inked back then. They were inked for about $550 a foot. Um, today, according to the experts I've talked to with Cornish and Carrier DTC and a couple other companies, leasing companies, those leases today would go out the door at about $650 to $7 a foot. In relative terms, Los Altos is at the low end of the leasing scale when compared to other communities in the area. Downtown Mountain View, seven to eight dollars a square foot, Council. Downtown Palo Alto, eight to ten dollars a square foot, Council. And Sand Hill Road, what? <laughs> How much? Double digits. Double digits, meaning it's 12, it's 14, 12. pardon? It's about 12 and sinking. 12 and sinking, okay. <laughs> As I said, we like our cycles. Um, so we are at the lower end of the scale by about, I mean, com compared to Sand Hill Road, I would submit to you that I think this is a better location to be in rather than Sand Hill Road because we have more restaurants that you can walk to. Sand Hill Road has a sun deck and what's the one over at the Rosewood? The Madeira. The Madeira. You need reservations for that place <laughs> for lunch. So <clears throat> my proposal here is that the city is sitting on some very, very valuable dirt. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, by the way, this is my land residual analysis for the 400 uh, uh, main building. But let's take a look at what the value of that dirt is. So the city sits on about 300 and I need glasses, 86,000 square feet times $640 a foot. And by the way, we can 
we can agree that reasonable people can disagree. I may be off by three to five percent, maybe ten. Who knows? Um, uh, by the way, I think I'm low. Um, so, if the city's land is worth <coughs> roughly a quarter of a billion dollars, and you were to lease that land out, you could derive an income stream like our friends over at Mountain View do, and our friends at, at Stanford do, you could derive an income stream on that land of anywhere from seven to $12 million a year. What can you do with seven to $12 million a year? Anybody have an idea of what you can do with seven to $12 million a year in the city of our size? What's our current budget? Anybody know? 28 million operating. There you go. Okay, so does that kind of help the budget? Okay. So, anybody think that we're not sitting on a valuable asset over here in downtown? So the question is, how do you tap that asset? That is a political discussion, and that is far beyond what I am willing to undertake today. <laughs> but suffice it to say, if you go to other downtowns, like Mountain View, <coughs> or most other downtowns, you're not gonna find Basically, the better part of three to 400,000 square feet of fallow land just sitting there for people to park on a grade. By the way, if you really want to destroy value, have the city build a two or three story parking structure. If you really want to destroy value, have them put a little retail component in that parking structure when they build it. <laughs> that, will, that will conclusively cost the city tens of millions of dollars and you will get nothing back from it, except in 25 years, you will crush it with a little piece of concrete about this size. They'll form great base rock for the next development. So be very, very careful, because you are sitting literally on a diamond mine. And, yes, sir? Why is, um, why would you crush the value? Would you put a retail space in there? Well, <clears throat> I've actually done the, the land residual analysis for what happens when you build a small parking structure on uh, one of the surface lots. Because I thought it was a great idea. But when you do the numbers, the problem is the numbers just sink you into a hole that you just can't climb out of. Um, you don't get very many parking spaces out of it because by the time you're done putting in your speed ramps and by the time you're done putting in your columns, uh, you lose a tremendous number of parking spaces on grade. And then you don't pick up very many as you go up because you're only going up you know, one or two stories at the max. Um, so there's certain geometric geometry problems when you put in small parking structures that you have to contend with. And I'm not a parking expert, although I know a few, and they kind of gave me a few hints about how to do the numbers and the math. But suffice it to say, and I'd be happy to share the value with somebody else at a later time, it will destroy value if you build a small parking structure downtown. Um, the Palo Alto has done that, hasn't it? So are they destroying value on Palo Alto? <coughs> what are the heights of their parking structures? It's like the highest is three stories, five stories. Three stories? Four. 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 <laughs> both four and they're two under and four up, so they're yeah. six stories. Oh, six stories. Okay, now we're talking. Well, the one on Alma is like three, three, three stories. Alma and Bryant are both six. Yeah. By the way, that six. parking structure on Alma that you're referring to is an albatross that cost them probably close to $200,000 a car to park it. Um, there's, a, there's an elevator issue too. Yeah, so I, I, can't, I can't address that, but, but yes sir. This is the land lease value. Yes. But if you, you have to add to that the property taxes and the sales tax revenues. So In what a, way? It's a lot more than that. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> So you're suggesting that after the, the land is leased, improvements are built, and that improvement then pays property taxes uh, yeah, on an agile basis. And or generate sales tax. And or generate sales tax. You're right. And I didn't include that in here, but that would be many, many millions more. Yeah. And also, it would have people that would come down to lunch and dinner and, and breakfast and go outside of those buildings and use the... Uh, the services of basically all the other restaurants in town and, and any other services in town. So it would be a tremendous value generator for the city. So 
So if anybody here doesn't think that their house is, is worth money because the land under the house is the value driver, if anybody here wants to give away their <laughs> land, call me because I would like to buy all of your land for a very greatly reduced number. By the way, if you're a city and you want to stay in business for perpetuity, you lease your land. That allows you to pay your retirement and your medical and it allows you to administer the city in perpetuity. If you want to be in business for a short period of time, you sell your land. And then you take the money and you put it in your own fund and you just disperse it. That's a personal take on the situation, by the way. <laughs> so I don't mean to shock anybody, but you know, I think good stewardship here would suggest that you don't sell land, especially when you, you know it's undeveloped and sitting you're sitting on a gold mine. Yes, sir. But um <clears throat> Sort of normal microeconomic <coughs> theory would indicate that there is no difference in selling the land or leasing the land because the, the sale price includes the future revenues from that. Uh, I don't understand why that's, I don't, just at a very high level, I don't understand why that's true. It seems to me that economics, microeconomics would be. Do you want me to We have a lot of slides to get okay. through. I'll, I'll the, turn it over. The answer to that question, uh, talk to the people. I work with people who do the lease, the land leasing at Stanford, and they'd be glad to give you uh, an immediate answer as to why they will never sell any of the land that they're sitting on and will make a fortune. <coughs> but they sold Stanford Shopping Center, right? After that, they will never sell any of the rest. Excuse of the me. Okay. Simon Group uh, bought a 75% land lease interest in Stanford Shopping Center. Stanford uh, trustees hold a 25% interest in that land lease. And Stanford has not sold one square inch of land. And by the terms of the trust, they cannot. Right. Stanford Shopping Center will revert to Stanford in a 100%, and in in the reversion term is 53 years. And they pay, <coughs> I think, I may be wrong about this, it's been a few years. I think they paid $333 million for that 75% land lease interest, of which they do not own 100% of the land lease interest. They only own a portion. Stanford holds basically a veto power over anything that's done to that shopping center. Okay. I may be wrong about my numbers, by the way. It may have been more. You, you you aren't suggesting that uh, it's possible to convert these shopping uh, parking plazas into retail, do you? What do you do? Now well, I think, you, I think converting it to retail parking, would be a huge mistake. I mean, it, I mean, so it's it's really an academic uh, idea that you can lease that to uh, a, a re retail establishment. Have you? Because then you lose your parking. Have you been to Stanford Shopping Center? Many times. What are they doing to the parking lots? Where is the new uh, Emporium Capital building? I can tell you that. It's on the parking lot. What used to be the parking lot? The parking structures they have there are currently two levels. They will go to four and five. And they have the elevators. Just, Pardon me. They just, have just to be clear, the the uh, when we're talking about when, and then I'll get to these slides. The parking structure at Bryant is a phenomenal success. There is not a single time that it isn't booked through, it isn't been used by the public up to the third story, the fourth story, the fifth. All of that circling around that people used to do to the surface lots is done. People drive right through Bryant, go up to the parking structure, they park and there's no problem. Just Ted and I might have different opinions about some things, but I think what we agree on, if you don't do a big enough parking structure, you lose the whole value of doing a parking structure. He's right. And, not, and, and number two, we, and I'll get into why, to put um, retail, more retail into this town, when we have a duplication of Main Streets, is literally like pouring sand in the desert when you go to the desert. And I'll, I'll explain why in the next, you know, 20 or 25 slides. Um, there's, there's one slide that was left out when we put the deck together. It was questions I'm frequently asked about downtown. Uh, <clears throat> does the community want to see more vibrancy in its downtown? Does Los Altos have the right mix of retail, office, and residential? Does Los Altos have the services and businesses it wants downtown? <coughs> do we have sufficient parking? Will we have it in the future to meet our future vibrancy goals? 
and um, we combined slides about uh, very late last night and somehow that slide got left out. Moving on to this slide, this is the current composition of the, of the downtown triangle. There's some numbers in here. I think most people in the room have, have been very involved with different aspects of city of the city in terms of being on ad hoc committees and working hard to create a place that will get better and better for all of us and for visitors to the town. Currently, there's 350,000 square feet of office, 395,000 residential. There's 274 square feet of, of retail, including um, Safeway and Draegers. Uh, 85,000 of restaurants and other food and beverage, and 235,000 of service. And the very surprising number in there is the 120,000 square feet of banks and financial services. But these numbers literally are cataloging every building in the downtown triangle. This, now, this, land. Is, this is this isn't in the original parking district. This is in the downtown is this triangle. Land or a square foot of building? Square foot of building. Hey David, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt for just a minute. <clears throat> Let's hold our questions um, so that we can uh, get through the presentation. And just, just hold them. I know we've got a lot of them. And I think it would be, a, and, I, and they're interesting. And if we were here all morning, I think it'd be great. But I think for the time, we've got a half hour left. So let's just let them go through it. And then uh, Jerry will, but you and others that are asking questions, I think we'll get back to it. Thanks very much. You can say it's a building. Uh, sorry about that, it is building. Um, moving on to the, the, so I wanted to set that up just so people have an idea of what already exists. In a relationship between office, retail, and restaurant, the vibrancy within a downtown area is created by the synergy of an appropriate mix of office, retail, and restaurant. Residential. Uh, and residential, sorry about that. Good local and regional restaurants will choose to locate in downtown that has sufficient daytime population. I spent probably 11 months trying to lease the front part of the building owned by Bart Nelson, uh, where Turn Restaurant is now. I went to literally every existing restaurant that was doing some significant business in the Bay Area, asking them to come to our town. It finally took a local guy and two restaurant partners who stepped up and said, we want to do something we've always wanted with lifelong residents of Los Altos, and they opened Turn Restaurant. The biggest, the, the, by far, number one issue that was presented to me by every restaurant that turned us down was that we don't have enough office. We don't have enough people on the street. I kept hearing feet on the street, I kept hearing office. And the problem is that there's a, for them to wanna to come, there's three segments of, of uh, restaurant business. There's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All of the dinner houses, most of them will want to do lunch, so they do lunch and, and dinner. All of the places that are breakfast, cafe, coffee shops will want to do breakfast and lunch. They need the lunch component. They can't exist on what they can do in a bedroom, what they would call a bedroom community on a Saturday, or what they can do um, after work in the evening. It's changing. The good news is we did get two good restaurants to come in and add to the mix. So Trellis is a uh, was waiting for a bigger premises, uh, a bigger uh, space, and they took a 6,000 square foot space at, uh, at Main, First and Main, and Orange Main Street building. They're a great operator, they're out of uh, uh, Half Moon Bay, they've been there for 21 years, and they wanted to open a second store. So those two, so those two <coughs> happen, but it's still a, a struggle whenever we want to try to attract restaurants. The, um, the, if you look at the site criteria, when we do retail, we're on pretty much every broker's mailing list in Northern California, and every single site criteria uh, sheet that we see talks about um, daytime, they wanna know the daytime population, they wanna know what the office square footage is, and they want good residential demos. Our residential demographics are off the charts. Within three miles of this town, you couldn't ask for more disposable income uh, in the Bay Area. Um, it, it, it isn't as dense as Mountain View because there aren't the number of multifamily apartments, but it still is absolutely fine for the kind of requirements that most restaurants and retails have, retailers have. It isn't just restaurants though. The other problem is retailers. They want to see people all the time. They don't want to just see them when they're packed on Saturdays. They don't want to see them just between 4.30 and 6 when people get off, you know, leave work. Move on to the next one. 
economic engine. Statistically, for every primary job that's created, three additional support jobs are created uh, to support uh, either service the new employees or to uh, you know, support them. That's both restaurant and coffee shop jobs, they support retail, and, and they support uh, the primary job instead. Move on to the next one. Statistics about how new offices and how businesses benefit. If you take the 20,000 rentable square feet approximately that, were, that was uh, leased at first in Maine, uh, about uh, 60, it brought roughly 60 new employees downtown. Class A office buildings are generally leased to professional uh, tenants, financial services, attorneys, etc. You don't have the density of um, office occupation you have with some of the tech companies that want to uh, do uh, employee for every 150 square feet or every 100 square feet. So just approximating, uh, you know, taking the three per thousand, you get 60 new employees downtown. If you, uh, we're gonna be running short of time, so just to go through the math, uh, if you add the three dashes, you add the number of time the average office employee eats out, the time they purchase breakfast, these are based on, these are from statistics that have come from the different organizations I belong to, you get to two and a half times per week, two and a half, maybe one night a week, or they average one night a week staying for dinner, you get 360 more meals per week consumed in downtown restaurants and coffee shops. That's what's created from additional office. Uh, next slide. Residential units provide, they average about three people per household, uh, about two and a half breakfast coffee shops per week, two and a half uh, dinners per week, and one lunch per week. Each new residential unit, that gives you about 18 more uh, restaurant visits adding to the downtown. This is a slide that compares the current composition of um, office. Want to go back one? Yeah. No. Go forward. There we go. Um, if you look at the downtown office space, we have 350,000 square feet currently. Mountain View has a million two forty-four. Palo Alto, of course, is not something that's comparable. I think we'd all agree with. Los Altos, I'm not sure anyone in the room wants us to be comparable to Palo Alto in terms of the composition of the town. But it's, these are the four, these are the, our, these are the towns that every retailer will get in the conversation with me in every restaurant when they talk about coming to, to Los Altos to fill the vacancies that appear from time to time. And so Palo Alto is a million nine, Menlo Park is 657. Even Menlo Park, and this is just in downtown. This is not any of the Menlo area around Bohannon, uh, Bohannon Street. It's not any of the uh, outlying. Uh, they have 657,000 square feet. Here's the current daytime population. We have 5,560 5, daytime employees um, in a one mile radius. As you can see, Mountain View is almost three times that, Palo Alto is eight times that, but even Menlo Park is four times that. And this is probably the most telling slide uh, in terms of where we are versus other towns. Menlo Park is a, is a very similar town in the, in the retail sort of lexicon because it has about the same residential population. It's surrounded by other towns that you might be able to draw as a destination town and it, um, it has its own sort of its own integrity and hopefully its own synergy with the different businesses that reside there. And even even Menlo Park has four times the amount of office, a little over four times the amount of daytime population. If you go to two mile radius, I just wanted to show those numbers. We go up to twenty four thousand, and it's because of the people that uh, I think that I know that two mile includes where VMware and Tesla is, etc. But of course, we still are uh, almost in the same ratios with other towns. More than, less than half of Mountain View. Um, we catch up to Palo Alto a little, but we're still, uh, Benlo Park's still two and a half times the number of workers that we have coming into, you know, working here. Moving on. If you, when we um, tried to analyze where we 
you know, what the, what the desired ratio is for downtown, it boiled down to 45% office, 40% housing, residential, and 15% retail, restaurant, and service. Um, the key trends that have driven these ratios, retail has historically been overbuilt um, in, in most towns, and as they've added, they wanted to have retail services there. You, you open a town, World War II ends, towns start, people moved in, they built subdivisions, and you need retail businesses, especially grocery stores and drug stores, to service the business. And that's how retail starts. It started all across America, both uh, you know, before the Depression, and of course, after, and after World War II. <clears throat> and then, as, as, as retailers and restaurants start struggling, because there's not enough people to buy their services, housing, multifamily starts being built, as uh, in this in, in this town in this valley, Silicon Valley develops. We need more workers, more multifamilies built, more land is developed, <clears throat> and then more offices get built. The other thing that's happened that I, that is something that is kind of sits there looming on the shoulders of every town is the strong ramp up of internet sales. Um, they in the, the by the end of 2015 they're going to be up be about $330 billion annually, and internet sales have increased by an average of 16.5% each of the past five years. They were on a 30% incline uh, until about 2010, and then as the base finally started getting bigger, the incline started leveling. It went from a hockey stick to like a half a hockey stick going up. Um, in that same five-year period, that year after year, we had a 16.5% increase in internet sales. Overall sales in America grew 0.9%. So if they grew 0.9% and the other ones grew 16.5% a year, you obviously have a big contraction of retail brick and mortar sales. Moving on to the next one. Um, this is where, if, now if you go back to the square footages of, built, of buildings within the downtown triangle, and you take them as a percentage. Currently, the downtown um, triangle office buildings are 26% versus the desired 45%. Housing is 29 versus 40. Retail restaurants and services were at 45% versus 15%. We are three times the amount of retail that we should be for desired um, downtown. And it's a, it's a really significant number. One of the other things I get, and it's interesting because people in the room might have heard this uh, kind of bandied about, but I get all the time from um, client tenants we approach is, we don't understand why Los Altos uh, has a duplicate Main Street. And, I, and, I, and they say it, and I, I kind of say, well, no, it, they're different. Main Street and State Street are very different. But the reality is going coming in from outside, <clears throat> we literally have doubled and with the current um, restrictions on what can be put on Main and State Street, right now they have to remain purely retail because of the zoning that we have. And because of that, and because of the lack of office and the lack of multifamily, we're at 45% versus 29 and 26. But we're 45% versus a total of 55%. We're almost, um, well you can see we're, we're, a half, we're almost one to one versus the sum of office and housing. Next slide. The Downtown Development Committees in 2000, uh, the Committee 2 and Committee 3, um, <clears throat> the recommendation at the end of the meetings of uh, development, uh, Downtown Development uh, Committee 2 was to add 895,000 square feet of office and to add 500 residential units, which is about 750,000 square feet. The recommendation of the DDC-3 was to add another 200,000 square feet of office to the 895 that already were called for. Um, the EIRs were completed for both sets of recommendations. In 2012, oddly, council passed new interior height limit for Main and State Street that abruptly changed from everything that had been studied from 2004 to 2010 and recommended um, in terms of form-based zoning, everything changed to all of a sudden there was an interior height limit. So to, to this, there's a little bit of confusion about what the current ordinance is. It doesn't specifically forbid three stories. 
but because the pyramid height, the pyramid height is still at 38 feet, that didn't change. But the envelope all of a sudden had a restriction on interior height, which made it literally impossible to do a third story. So in an era where we don't have enough feet on the street, for some reason, the council in 2012 decided to restrict the number of people within a building by restricting the interior height. And I was baffled. I was completely baffled. I, did, I just didn't understand why I would do it. It didn't change people's vistas. It didn't change the ability to view the mountains and all the rhapsodic uh, emails that are sent to town, the town crier. And I think people just don't understand. No one's talking about building buildings higher than 38 feet. But if you don't change the interior height restriction, you can never do a third story. What, what is evil about three stories within the same height as opposed to two stories? At the end of the slide deck, you'll see a lot of slides in an appendix that show very attractive ways to do a 38 foot height building with articulations of the building that make, make them extremely attractive. They're not a big block mass like the 400 Main Street building, the, the uh, 400 Main Street building is. And this is something that I'll get to again in the recommendations at the end of the slide. David, please. Yeah. Uh, are you implying that today our code still measures a building to its interior building height? It measures both, it has a restriction on both the exterior height and it has a restriction on the interior height. Our, our code is, is based on exterior height. No, but it's the, no, no, it's not. Being, <laughs> based on the roof deck. It should be. The roof deck yeah. and then the interior. Um, so, move, try, moving on a bit, um, I mean, on this slide, if you, and again, you see 45, 40, and 15, and the DDC recommended 45, 35, and 20. So our own development committees, which were appointed by the, the city, actually were pretty much in league with what the ULI and, and with hundreds of publications kind of consolidate down to 45, 40, and 15. We were 5% different in what was recommended for housing, and we were 5% different in what was recommended for retail. So it's pretty similar. Moving on. Here's the effects that, that the scarcity of daytime population has. I already went into this a little bit on an earlier slide. It's been difficult to attract and retain good restaurants and retailers due to the lack of daytime population. You'll, you'll notice in the last seven or eight years, we've had, there is a turnover. There's a turnover of retailers and there's a turnover of restaurants. If you don't come in with a strong enough concept, if you don't come in with an experienced staff, if you don't come in with goods and services people want, you're not gonna make it. And it isn't a question of rents. There's this misnomer that our rents have now gotten too high for retail that it's pushing people out. Our rents are now viewed as a bargain. We're, we're at the top of Main Street, around 2nd and Main, we're in the four, we're right around $4. As you go towards um, San Antonio, every block the rents get less because there's simply less foot traffic. And they go down from $4 down to about two and a quarter at the bottom of the street. On State Street, the rents are anywhere from $2 to 375. Palo Alto's retail rents are now seven to 715 a foot. Burling Games are 550 a foot. Menlo Parks are $4 to $5 a foot. So it's not rents, it's the fact that we would, People want to have more pocket, more daytime people, more workers here to attract. When you, when independents and, and regional trains, what they look for is they look for strong co-tenancy. So we're in that sort of tautology almost of um, imagine, imagine a lemming, a picture of lemmings. If you put all the national retailers together, they would be pretty much sitting on that, sitting on that um, um, parrot swing as lemmings waiting to see who dives in. <laughs> and so if you don't, if one or two or three don't dive in, nobody's gonna dive in. And, and the problem is we're not gonna attract Chipotle, we're not gonna attract an apple, we simply don't have enough people. But we do wanna attract people, we do wanna attract <coughs> retailers like a therapy that has 14 stores, or uh, like Lululemon, uh, not Lululemon, like Lulu's that has four stores, or you know, other, other chains, other regional chains. If we can get them, then we can have more dynamic, more exciting mix of retailers. 
Um, we're also, the third bullet, we're viewed by soft goods, retails, and restaurants as a bedroom community. I think that's changing. I think the bump outs that the city did on the different corners has been a dramatic help. There's, there is more activity, there is more vibrancy on the street. People see that, they want to come down. If anyone's been here on the first Fridays, it's been great walking around town, so that's getting better. Next slide. This is something that I wanted to bring up that I don't think people thought through, or it just hasn't been on people's minds. Right now there's a service mer uh, moratorium on, you cannot do a service, you can't lease a service business on Main Street, State Street, and a portion of First Street that runs over to Safeway. The good news, there's finally a cap on more hair and nail salons. That's why the service moratorium started. There were simply way too many hair and nail salons. The bad news is we can't lease to a yoga, a, a uh, Yoga Works is a national yoga chain, um, Super Cycle, Cycle Bar, um, Soul Cycle, all have wanted to come here. I've talked to them about vacancies that I've represented downtown. They don't want to be on the side streets. They want to be on Main and State. This is changing all across America. You go into Palo Alto, you see people spinning right in on University or Hamilton or Bryant or Lytton. We right now restrict service businesses. We have these vacancies, the back part of 255 um, uh, 2nd Street where the Los Altos Pharmacy was and then uh, Safeway Pharmacy for the last two years. It's taken me nine months to rent it. We've been in discussions with every one of those service businesses. They don't want to be on the back side. They want to be out on Main Street or State Street. As we're losing categories of businesses to retailers, I think we really should think about, let the market dictate, as the last bullet says, the highest and best use of real estate. Um, because of online real estate, we all have to adjust to the fact that certain categories are shrinking. Uh, apparel has been decimated by online retailing. What do we have the most of in town? We have the most apparel shops. They're struggling. They're having a hard time making it. Moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> um, obstacles to improving the quality of retail and restaurants. We've, I've probably beaten to death the insufficient daytime population, uh, lack of available parking during peak times. I know that the, as a member of the parking committee, that's something that we're, we've been spending hours and hours working on. Um, the council's been spending a lot of time on it. I think that's going to get better. Uh, but we clearly have a lack of available parking between 11 and 2. It's a, it's at a, almost at a crisis point in terms of people come here and want to lease and they, they'll, they'll make eight or nine trips with their employees trying to park and then they realize we have a parking problem. Lack of appropriate store dimensions. The buildings are obsolescent. We have buildings that were built between 1920 and 1955. They are generally um, very narrow. They're 20 feet to either uh, 60, 80, 100, or 120 feet deep. In our town, they're almost always 20 feet to 80 feet, or, or 25 feet to 100 feet. Retailers, the, the dynamic retailers want is to be no more than two and a half times the depth as you have the width. They want frontage. They want at least 25 feet of frontage. Our buildings are very narrow. If you put two together, yeah, you have 40 feet of, of frontage, but now you have 200 feet that you have to fill up in the back. And the problem, it, it, it's interesting because I've sat and had coffee and the coffee ended up being a two hour meeting with someone where we're talking about how do you do development without people being terrified of development. <clears throat> the reason we need to do development, folks, is not to line the pockets of the people who happen to own the building. The reason that there should be some possibility of development in the original parking district is we need to change the buildings. The buildings are obsolete. The current retailers and restaurants, they don't have enough frontage and they're not wide enough. And the way to do that would be to redevelop them. If you can't go more than two stories, you can't, it's, it's totally economically unfeasible to develop the building. If that's what the town wanted, if we really could have a referendum and not phone, a phone call of 400 people who happened to be at home at the time the phone rang, if we have a real study, I would be glad, I, as a resident of the town, whatever the town wants to do, we should all do, we should get behind together and do. But right now, we have this low squat original parking district 
that's limited to two stories and limited to never, unless there's gonna be a major earthquake, it's not gonna change. And I don't mean to scare the, any landlords in the room about a major earthquake, but uh, right now that's what's gonna happen. How does Los Altos stack up? <clears throat> Daytime population, someone put a negative smiley face there. <laughs> Parking solutions right now is a negative. Appropriate store dimensions is a negative. Reputation, and I meant reputation as a sleepy bedroom community is a negative. And enough attractive retailers. That lemming issue of Joe and Bob aren't in there, so I'm not gonna come. How those deterrents might be addressed improve the ratio of office housing and retail. Start working up to at least two or three to one instead of uh, one to one. Maximize density within the building envelope by allowing people to really build three stories. Enable office use in more of the downtown. Consider taking the, looking at the zoning, having a zoning, it's just a suggestion, maybe a zoning subcommittee. And I, I know there's some council people here who probably don't want to think about, oh my God, more ad hoc committees, but um, you know, possibly something that looks at the zoning and figures out. When I say office use, I don't mean an accounting office. I mean offices that are that are consumer facing. A, a somebody where it's an office that uh, you know, a uh, real estate office, a um, office that does financial services, and people come to the office, something like that. And maybe we only allow them on a certain block, but at least allow some office to come on Main and State Street and that part of First Street. Allow fitness business on Main Street, and this is something that to me is not, would not be difficult to change. Take the service ordinance and consider changing it and, and restrict it to what type of service businesses. When people come to work out, when they come to the yoga and the flies and the soul cycle, they want to eat afterwards. They want to, they're exhausted. They, want to, they actually, studies have proven, and I get, the, I get all the politics from the retailers who want to come here. They do other events downtown besides just going to work out. And then create more parking supply in the short term. Um, there's a, we've been doing studies of how to possibly reconfigure and restripe the parking plazas and the loading zones so that uh, the public can use the loading zones between 11 and 2, and we can have uh, more cars in the parking plazas, and then possibly developing a number of the plazas for long-term public and private land leases, where you have a combination of, you have a public-private, some way, you have a, in, in my mind, the possible, possible way to do it is on the outskirts of the OPD, you do a four-story building with one or two floors of office and the rest being de dedicated to parking. And you really, and the city makes a very good return on its money by leasing to the developer. Four minutes. Four minutes. <clears throat> That's it. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Uh, yeah, you, want... um, I could, you could leave them on in the background. Yeah. Keep them out. Yeah. Is that? I didn't, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of interest in question and answer, so let's yeah. just leave these on in the background. Okay. Yeah. Like, do you want to moderate this? Yeah, yeah. I okay. guess the, the population was on a radius basis, not on a, in Los Altos, or, because we have a lot it's of- It's a radius, you're right, Jerry, it's a yeah. radius basis. So, because we have a lot of people that live in Los Altos Hills that come over and, and my mother uh, went to the uh, uh, salons and, and uh, you know, more than 50% were from Los Altos Hills. That includes that's the radius. That's the radius. Yeah. That's yeah. The radius. John? In your presentation, you kind of suggested that if we correct the zoning without increasing the height limit um, on state and main, uh, we allow three stories, that would be great. But I've heard from some people doing economic analysis that in fact, even if we did that, there will be very minimal development in the next 20 years. In other words, there will be a few property would develop, but not very many at all. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I, have, I have to admit that I am the person that when asked by Val Carpenter at a parking meet, at a uh, city council meeting, why, um, why did you propose a three-story, why are you in favor of a three-story building? And I said, because our town won't, 
won't ever allow a four story building. <laughs> and that is what I said. And I do remember that, and I still believe that. I don't, I believe that we do well articulated buildings with, um, with different, art, with articulation of buildings that make them attractive, that you could decide which <coughs> parts of the downtown triangle, in addition to the expand, which parts outside the parking plaza you could do possibly four stories. I think with three stories, at least you get the possibility of doing some. So, so it's, it's just like half a loaf instead of a full. I'll take you back on that. So the value of a finished foot of a Class A office building in downtown Los Angeles today is somewhere north of $1,600 a square foot. <coughs> Cold shell costs 350 bucks a foot to build. <coughs> All the other component parts, let's say it's another 150 bucks a foot. Cost of production, $500 a foot. Value <coughs> north of $1,600 a foot. I put in 500, I get $1,600 back. Who wants to loan me $500? <laughs> because I will go out and build office buildings where I can make $1,100 plus a foot. And by the way, those are under conservative assumptions. And agreed, we are at the top of a cycle. But still, I'd be fairly conservative assumptions. Let, let me just give you an example real quick. Redwood City built the retail first when <clears throat> they would come. They built, the, they built that center. People have been there where the Century Theater is. It's called Broadway on Redwood City. And, and the retailers were dying there. In the last two years, there, are, there, there were seven cranes in the air. In downtown Redwood City, there is a phenomenal amount of office going in, Class A office building going in, attracting tech companies and, and financial services. Now, I will tell you, there's a huge difference. They are right on this Calpin line. And it puts them in a, in a very advantaged position versus the Los Altos. And I don't think, we're not suggesting seven or eight story buildings. We're just suggesting that the town and the people who live in this town think about three and four, three and four story buildings in, in some limited fashion. Since those office buildings have gotten built, the restaurants are doing better, the retail is doing better. It's a good example on a much bigger scale of what could be done here. Mark? Um, we have the lowest per capita income from uh, sales tax in the county or in the area. I think you maybe address some of the reasons why that is, because it's always been a question to me why, when we have great buying power, do we have such a low income from that? Does the reason well, why you speak to that? Let, let me tell you that um, this does not disparage people that are my age that thought <laughs> they want to open a retail business. But until about three or four years ago, the majority of retail stores in this town were hobby businesses. They were either a husband or a wife's hobby. They were not a hobby shop. They were their hobby. They opened a business that was purely based on what their fancy was about. If they fancied themselves a, a well-dressed woman, they opened a woman's clothing store. If they fancied themselves an RC person, they'd open up. We had hobby businesses that did not generate. We were doing $200 a square foot in sales tax. You want to be able to, and say in gross sales, you want to do at least 400 or 500 in gross sales. So if we have the wrong retailers, Mark, we're not going to generate. So, and second, we don't have enough of them. You mentioned the second-hand retailers too on one of your slides. Right. Well, we have yeah, I was I was racing <coughs> for the slide right. to get the finish. Well, obviously the the value per, per purchase is not high in those stores either. I, and I think it, I mean it's a radical proposal, but I think we could at least restrict no more second-hand retailers. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, exactly. It right. it is a you know, there's four or five of them in our town, and it's not good for the vitality and the vibrancy of the town. Last question. Lou? You mentioned, of course, expanding to a third floor, and that would add square feet. Uh, and we have rules about how many parking spaces per square foot. Are you telling us that the address has changed? Because I, that, I, that I, was, right. I know right now, you're right, Jerry. Right now, we are limited because of the parking restrictions affect the, you can't build more than 100% FAR, and if you, if you could, if you could create more parking. Yeah. So if we could do that, either people have to build their own parking underneath, or we have to develop a parking in lieu program where people can pay in the parking, and those funds could be used both from restriping, they could be used eventually for the public portion of building a public garage, 
So we're it's a it's yes it's both it's yeah. sort of presenting both ideas. There haven't been too much enthusiasm for either of those. Well, either the parking garage or the there's been parking. some there's been some a lot of there's except for two members of the prior council there's been a lot of excitement for construction. Mm -hmm. There were two members who were against it, and they turned the tide. There were there were two other members who were very much in favor of construction. So it's not that there hasn't been enthusiasm. Most of the merchants in town, most of the the people who run the, own the stores are dying to have construction. We're, we're out of time at this point. Uh, we try to contain ourselves to 9.30. Uh, Ted and David, thank glad. you very much. <laughs>